welcoming you to the last in a five-part series for Retain It, Solutions on for Achieving Surgical and Restorative Success in the Edentulous Mandible. It is being presented by Dr. Matthew B. Hallis, founder, owner at Bay Lake Center for Complex Dentistry. And with that, it is my pleasure to first introduce Patrick Hayden, Senior Director of Sales with Stern Gold. Patrick, would you like to say a few words? Yes, th thank you, Jessica. Um, it's, it's great to be here. And, and uh, this is the uh, part five of the five part series. And it's, um, it's been a great five weeks. And I want to thank you, know, you and, and, and Dennis and, and DSG for co-sponsoring this with, with, with Stern Gold. And, and, and of course, Dr. Hallis, you know, re really appreciate doing this with you as well. You know, we've got a great um, partnership, you know, the three of us, and it's been, um, you know, we, we, ho we hope that all of you out there really find some great value with, with this fi five part series and uh, to improve um, your, uh, your, your clinical outcomes for, for you and your patients. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And it is, now it is my pleasure to introduce Dennis Urban, CDT, Director of Clinical Education. Thank you, uh, Jessica. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, it's great to be here. Sorry, I, could, I couldn't make it last week, but um, I can't believe it's five weeks already. Time has flown by, but uh, this has been a great series. Um, and um, like Jessica said, my name is Dennis Urban, CDT. I'm the Director of Clinical Education for National Dentex DSG. And tonight, we're excited to look at part five of the Retained series. And uh, last week, Dr. Hallis covered attachment design, selection, and options, clinical application of overdenture attachments, overdenture maintenance, and it was some great relevant information. So, uh, but Dr. Le and Dr. Hallis will tell you about himself, but Dr. Le Hallis has lectured on dental implant planning, placement, and restoration protocols and procedures throughout North America. And tonight in part five, Dr. Hallis will be continuing to retain the series with in-depth information on implant system selections and integration, effective marketing in your dental practice, and patient selection and presentation. And it's my honor to present to you, Dr. Hallis. Welcome, Dr. Hallis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for having us. Thank you to Stern Gold and DSG for sponsoring us before. So as he said, who am I? For everybody that has tuned in, I'm assuming everybody knows who I am. Um, I went to school at Tufts. From Tufts, I went to UIC in Chicago for my cross training. I truly went there because they gave us surgical and restorative background, and it gave us a unique advantage for being in private practice now, which we're going to kind of talk about. Um, in terms of developing new techniques and how you could learn if you didn't have a training program. You know, techniques are constantly changing and I'm constantly adding new techniques to my uh, armamentarium. So we're going to go through that. Um, I ended up in uh, Green Bay because of fishing. Um, my wife and my hobby is fly fishing. There's not many prostodontists that fly fish with their wives. Um, so that is kind of the joining force, I can say, that brought us together, brought us into Green Bay. Um, from there, we expanded the practice. We have a satellite location in Escanaba. We have one in Marquette. Our home base is Green Bay. Um, I am actually here today. I'm still in my scrubs. It was quite a long day. I was supposed to be off this week, and I had to come in and really work because the schedule is kind of hectic, but that's life. It's better to be busy than slow, so I can't complain. Um, I truly am fortunate we are we have a practice that is focused on implant complex reconstructions, full mouth rehabs. Um, do I do a single implant? Absolutely. But do I focus on the big hard cases? Uh, yes, I have a referral base practice. Um, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the shifting um, market and what people need to do and look uh, as we go through today's lecture. But this is what I want to see when I'm back in the office on Monday. Um, a case that with a terminal dentition, and we're going to put multiple implants in and transition this patient to a fixed implant reconstruction. There's not a day that doesn't go by in our office that we're using implants for smile transitions. Uh, I think it's critical. And I'm a big believer in this statement. If you're not providing implant treatment, you're not providing the standard of care. I assure you every morning, every afternoon, there's not a case that we're not working with implants. I think they're a game changer for multiple to uh, multitude of treatments and really giving us a differentiating options. And what is important is I am paid to speak. I'm not paid to use these products. Everything I use and show is what I do in the office. Um, we will go through what I use, why I use it today in a little bit of more detail from the last two lectures on how I choose the systems, why I choose some components, um, 
and how we talk to patients. And we really have to select what is the appropriate care for that patient. So with that said, I'm paid to speak, but I'm not paid to use these products. If there was a better product, I assure you I would use it. Okay. Um, as I said, I used to partly lecture so I could force you to see all our vacations. Um, COVID has changed that, right? We kind of backstepped on vacations. Now it kind of feels weird to start traveling again. Uh, my five-year-old and I were just down in uh, Kansas. We had a 1500 mile two-day road trip because of how things had to change, but he was a trooper. We had to go down and pick up our dog who was in hunting training. Uh, he is just wired and excited now, Hunter. Um, so he's got his new hunting buddy and he is ready to start hunting this fall with me. So it should be a good time. So with that said, uh, we've hit the last part on the five part series. Um, in this retain it for the mandibular overdenture therapy, focusing on both the surgery and the restorative aspects. Okay? Um, if you want, you can look back at, as they said on DSG, they created a landing page. There's other courses that we will be giving. So it is quite nice to have multitude of options as we are going through to be able to review and look and talk. Okay? Um, today, we're gonna talk about continuing education. Today is a good introduction. Um, and the last four weeks are really an introduction into what you need to do and kind of decide on a skill set. The challenge I see with continuing education is people do not create a plan. And one of the things my partner and I just literally talked about this morning was, what are we gonna do for the next year in terms of what we need to bring to the office? What is a technique that is gonna bring value? One of the problems in dentistry that I see is we buy a lot of toys, but things that don't bring value or make us more clinically efficient bring us return on our investment, you know, streamline the patient treatment, more efficient, um, becomes really important. Uh, you know, we're required to do CE, but we need to choose CE that's going to bring value to our practice. Okay. From there, implant system selection and integration within your dental practice, you need to have your assistants involved in every aspect. If it's something with the front desk and marketing, they have to be involved. If it's something that it needs multitude of coordination, you got to have an office manager. I'm going to talk about that because that is one of the keys to our success. Our office manager, we kind of violate the rule, is my wife. Um, she basically runs the office. I handle the dentistry. I know what I'm doing in dentistry. I want to stay away from a lot of this nonsense. I oversee it, but we're going to talk about integrating things. You know, if I'm not in the operatory, we're not doing well, right? We have to think about that as dentists. From there, I'm going to talk about some marketing. You know, I focus our marketing slightly different than some of my friends' practices because I want to tailor to a specific need of our practice. Okay, so questions at the end, we will answer them again. Um, I'll leave plenty of time. I don't really have much to do. I just have to get home to the dog and take them out. Um, so if it takes a few extra minutes, not a problem. So this becomes important as you kind of start looking to bring new techniques in. You have to look at your history and you have to have an honest assessment of your clinical skills. What is your diagnostic, your restorative, your surgical background? Okay, what is your motivation? Today, you know, over the last five weeks, I should say, we have been talking about surgery and restoration. So do you like the surgery? Do you like the restoration? Do you have time dedicated to the training? You know, when we start looking at these techniques, you're not gonna just go to a weekend course and then be a master able to incorporate all of this in your practice, there's going to be a lot of humbling experiences and we need to kind of look at this. Um, you have to think about this. Will your ego, okay, let you be a beginner again? There's certain things that are, it's not going to go smooth, right? We're going to have a bad day. You're going to be double booked, triple booked. There's going to be a problem in hygiene. And then we have a new technique that's going to take us more time when we've mastered our other techniques that are we do day to day. So, with that, you have to have a comprehensive approach with a realistic assessment of your current skill levels and selection of techniques that will add value to your practice. And you have to think, how are we gonna get the instructions? Are we gonna do hands-on training? How are we gonna get live surgical experience, right? How are we gonna bring these techniques into our office in a smooth transition that's gonna allow us to incorporate them, be clinically efficient and add value? That really becomes the key, okay? So you have to identify what you will need to learn to be successful. Okay? A lot of my friends, okay, I have some friends that are coming out of school, some friends that didn't place any implants in school that want to do it. 
we choose doing a single tooth implant placement, healed site, then step up to an immediate implant site. Once we've gone through the healed site, now we have to refine it. We have to look at extraction techniques, bone grafting, soft tissue management and grafting, immediate provisionalization. You have to divide and conquer what we need to learn, what you are comfortable doing, what you already have integrated in your office, and how we're going to move through that. Okay? We have to think about what is multiple implant placement. You know, if we're going to be doing a healed edentulous ridge like we talked about, are we going to be able to put two implants in? Suppose we have to put that third implant in like I talked about. Are we going to do it with combination of extraction techniques? Are we comfortable doing alveoloplasty and creating that restorative space that I said was so critical, right? Just because we can drill the implant, we also have to do the other associated techniques, soft tissue reflection and management. Your suturing techniques, probably one of the number one time limiting um, clinician management issues is suturing, right? And then how are we gonna provisionalize that patient? What are we gonna use? In our past lecture, we talked about using the more mini implant in combination with a conventional implant. So how are we gonna do all these different techniques in order to create a streamlined approach to add value? So the first thing, and I can't stress this one enough, is find a good mentor, okay? You have to have somebody that you can talk to, rely on, ask for advice, and ultimately have somebody that can help you out of trouble, right? So in our circle, we have a lot of friends and we constantly talk and review. Okay? In my office, both myself and my partner are partners. So if he has a problem with the case, I will gladly help. If I have a problem with the case and I need an opinion, I need advice, vice versa, he will gladly help, okay? There's certain techniques that I beat the pants off him on in terms of speed and efficiency, but he does the same on other techniques, right? So we constantly are talking and figuring out how are we gonna make this better, okay? So you need to find a mentor. If you're fortunate and you're in a multi-group practice and somebody does the technique, work with him. If not, like in the case of my best friend, they'll show, who literally practices across the street, I am more than happy to mentor, okay? And you have to look at this as a team approach, okay? I'm always wary of the jack of all trades, right? I have a lot of techniques. Okay? I have a lot of skill set in terms of restorative surgical lab understanding, but I still have a team. I am the restorative dentist. Sometimes I am the surgeon, but I also work with my surgical colleagues often, and I mean on a daily basis. Our lab is part of the team. So you have to have a team of experts. At the end of the day, there's not a patient that wants an implant, they want teeth. So the restorative dentist needs to be the driving force. And we have to think about that as we're starting to look at our approach, right? And what we don't want to do is have a case that ultimately is planned poorly, executed clinically poorly, and then we have to redo everything. That is not what we want to see. So when we look at team training and education, the course should provide necessarily knowledge for you and and your team to successfully incorporate the technique into your practice. That's critical. I'm gonna come back from a course and I'm gonna tell Lisa or one of our assistants, I'm gonna say, please, I need X, Y, and Z. We need these parts, we need this. But they need to know how to set things up. They need to know how to assist during that procedure. What materials are you gonna have? What tools are you gonna to need? So I can't stress enough, I know it's a big cost, but bringing your assistants to the courses is a game changer making sure they know the techniques that you're gonna be doing and believe you can do them is a game changer, okay? So I like this. I needed to learn in the following, and here's how I did it. One of my friends wanted to learn extraction management for implant procedures. So as I said, we identify the necessary techniques, find a mentor, look at it, the textbooks and literature review, find other CE courses, and then we have to figure out how we're gonna integrate it into our office. One of the biggest mistakes I see is doctors going to a CE course and then not having patients lined up within the week or two at most to do these cases, okay? Not telling their front desk, their staff that we can do them, okay? That is absolutely critical. If you don't do that technique within the month, you probably will not integrate that technique into your office, okay? So when we we look at this and we talk about doing extractions and you travel the courses, okay? And we do trade shows and then you can come and do a mentorship in my office if you're one of my good friends, a colleague, okay, and we can help in a way to facilitate treatment. Absolutely. That's doctor that practices across the street from me. 
We did several different implants together. We did some bone grafting together. And now he does a bunch of implants on his own at his office. If he has questions, he still refers to more complicated ones to myself, a surgical colleague. And that is a true team working approach. Okay. You have to do a literature review. You have to understand and have references. We got to look things up. We can't just Google it and say, well, I saw it on the internet. This technique's going to work. Okay. We have to look for comprehensive courses. Okay? And I can't stress enough, there's a lot of different courses out there now that have cadaver training, hands-on live surgical training. Are they expensive? Yes. Are they complete and give you a full different perspective to be able to fully do this on a patient while watching the course? I think that's a game changer. And nowadays with things where they are and different licenses that we can do, this is all feasible. Okay. Practice, 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 okay? In your office, can you get a pig jaw to practice on for suturing and flap reflection? I can't stress enough, understanding suturing techniques is gonna be one of the critical factors in terms of surgery, okay? Primary closure is critical, okay? So how are we gonna do it? Are we gonna go observe a course, right? Live surgical options are fantastic. It allows you to see what's happening, going on. What is wrong? What is incorrect? What is correct that they're doing? Okay. There's different apps that we have available to enhance this. So I talked about the different selections, right, of abutments. So we need to look up restorative space that I talked about. So how much restorative space do I need for a locator? Dr. Hallis said that we need to improve our suturing techniques. So what is available? Okay, what can we read? Okay, after we've prepared all of the different knowledge and we feel confident that we understand the step by step, our assistants understand that we have the materials in our office, we have to then look at careful patient selection. Okay? It's your first implant surgery case in your office, maybe leading into the first restoration of an overdenture, who knows, right? We have to think about what level we are at. Okay? I am constantly getting new materials in my office to assess and look at and decide if I am gonna incorporate it. So when I talk about careful patient selection, what I am looking for is a patient that I know is going to be easy going. I do explain to the patient that this is going to be a new technique that I am doing. I'm going to block out extra time. And I usually do give a discount when I'm incorporating some new cases into my office. Okay? That gives them an understanding of what's going on. If something does go wrong, I always have bailout options. And that is where a mentor comes into play. If there is an option. How am I going to get out of this case if I don't know how to fix this? Or if something comes up that I haven't seen. Okay. So the big things okay, that we have to really address okay, when we're starting to incorporate a new technique, you're going to review the procedure with the dental team prior to the appointment and make sure that all your necessary equipment is there. It sounds kind of trivial, but, but it's, when you really look at it, I get probably at least one to two calls a month. Hey, can I borrow an implant? I did not order it. I'm doing a surgery today. I don't have the drills. They didn't get come in. I ordered them yesterday. They got shipped slowly. Okay. Make sure you have all of the equipment ahead of the procedure. Second, make sure you have enough procedure time. You're not going to be able to step in and out, in and out doing hygiene checks. Make sure you have it scheduled appropriately. Okay. Identify when to refer, like I talked about. Have a mentor you can call. Things will happen and be prepared for the complication. They're going to happen. Complications are going to occur. So let's look at this case. This is a great case, kind of building on what we talked about. We have a denture patient that wants to increase the retention. Good wide ridge like we talked about. Good cortical plates, right? Problem is we may have limited restorative space, so we have to think about that. Are we going to complete a veoplasty? If we are, do we have the right equipment? Straight hand piece, irrigation, reduction burrs, rongeurs, phone files, right? Do we have a surgical guide? Did we make it ahead of time? Does it have the reduction? How much reduction do we need, right? We talked about how much restorative space we need for these cases. We need acrylic. We need space for the teeth. We have the abutment that we're going to choose. We need bone and implant line. Okay? Then, as I said, this is a implant retained soft tissue supported restoration. At the end of the day, an overdenture is still supported by the tissues. And your success is based on the quality of your denture reconstruction. So we have to identify red flags. Are there undercuts? Do we have broad ridges that are going to provide lateral stability? Is the tongue enlarged? Is there a dry mouth that's going to affect suction? Okay. 
Does the patient currently have a denture? How long have they worn a denture? All those things that we talked about in part one and two, as we were kind of building the case. And then in restorative three, what are the abutments we're gonna plan for this case? Are we gonna use those stern snap? Are we gonna use the locator? Okay. From there, we're gonna look at assessment, the floor of the mouth mobility. Remember I said, as we kind of lift and the patient moves their tongue, is there a highly mobile floor of the mouth? If there is, that's gonna create additional fishtail motion. Where are we gonna place our implants? Typically in the most anterior portion to prevent um, the rocking in the seesaw, okay? Do we need to thin out any tori that are present? Do we have good keratinized tissue? All those things that we talked about, we have to start putting in a checklist and assessing as we go through the case. Is there room to place the attachments or do we need to make a new denture? Should we have metal reinforcement to prevent fracture of the denture, okay? How are we gonna make the surgical guide? Are we gonna duplicate in the office? Is the lab gonna make us one? Right. Then we're going to complete the surgery and select an implant system. Why do we select the system? What system are we going to use? Then our suturing technique, as I said, we need to learn to do single interrupted and continuous interlocking sutures. Okay. So what are things that happen to me? Okay. I've had a pretty much all happen over my career so far. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you have to identify the complication, tell the patient, and fix it, okay? It's simple, never try to hide something. Uh, one of my first implants I placed, um, I flowered. We were putting in a, uh, a narrow platform implant under too much torque, broke it, put in a wider one, fine, okay? I walked an implant through the buckle plate when I was learning to do immediate implants. I went in the mesial buckle route instead of the palatal route, and out that went. So now we're doing socket preservation. Initially, I struggled with primary closure, getting tension-free flaps, critical. Tension-free flaps with primary closure for bone grafting is a game changer. It's also a game changer when we're doing these big overdenture cases to make sure the patient's comfortable. You're gonna be slow. Any of the procedures we do, when we first start off, you are not gonna be a rock star. You're gonna be slow and you have to have enough time scheduled. Okay? We have to make it efficient. From there, we're gonna start the restoration. Choose the snaps, place the snaps, and then activate the matrix. When we think about it, and one of the biggest questions patients have is, what is the long-term maintenance, okay? Matrix reactivation and activation, okay? Is there the risk of overdenture fracture? Yes, if you did not place a metal framework in there. Do we need to reline and remake these dentures? How often do we see the patient? Typically once a year, right? All these questions that patients ask. And from there, once we have everything seated, life is good and then we put them in recare. okay? So with that, you have to pick and choose, okay? You don't just throw a dart board and start looking. You have to kind of decide, all right, we're gonna start with the webinar, then we're gonna look for a hands-on course to do this, and then we're gonna do select patients, find them, have them lined up from when I get back, make sure all the parts, pieces are ordered before you go to that course, okay? Sometimes I order them at the course, I don't like doing that, um, all the time, it depends. You need to talk to your reps and see what they recommend. They usually have starter packages for these courses, okay? I'm not trying to sell anything, but what I'm trying to stress is you cannot go to one of these courses without the plan to have and execute a case. If you don't have the case, it's not gonna get done. Now, this is, becomes critical, okay? This is where I see a lot of cases fail, okay? Is managing patient expectations and communicating with the patient. Now, there's many ways to do this, okay? In our office, I talk and handle the patients. I don't have a treatment coordinator. Some of my friends have treatment coordinators where the doctor diagnoses, writes the treatment plan, but somebody else presents, okay? Our practice's focus is on big reconstructions. I feel that I wanna explain and talk to that patient. That is what works in our model, okay? And I'm gonna use this case to talk about and highlight and then kind of shift into a case that we talked about, but review, because this becomes uh, just absolutely critical to make sure that we've achieved the patient's expectations. Okay? And we have to think about prosthetic considerations. So this is a typical referral into my practice. This is from a periodontist, okay? With patient expectations and concerns. Aesthetic compromise from previous periodontal surgeries, wants natural feel of the restorations, travels. She just got back from traveling around the world. She has a lifestyle where she is active 
and busy and feels teeth are important. History of periodontal disease with moderate horizontal bone loss. Posing dentition is stable for now, able to be maintained. History of failing implant number 13, two osseointegrated implants that are stable and restored at number four and five. Position of bony defects, sinus position, amount of interocclusal space, smile line, lip support, and then how are we gonna provisionalize this patient? So when we look at the case and we start the workup, we have to start identifying problems. Is a denture a solution? Is an overdenture a possibility? Can I do fixed reconstruction? Okay. We have to look at the space. Okay. How much restorative space do I have? Whether I'm doing an overdenture, a fixed bridge reconstruction, we need to know space. And we have to identify, okay, as I said, in every case, the type and size of defect. Am I treating one arch or both arches? What is the plane of occlusion? Is the ridge visible? Is there a high smile line? How much restorative space does my treatment require? Okay, where is the frame and where is the sinus? Okay, and what does this patient desire? If you don't achieve the patient's desires, the case is not gonna be a success. You might have a functional restoration, but if the patient's not happy, it's a failure, All right? So as I said, we have to present with simplified options. Okay? Do I give other patients options? 100%, and this is a case that drives home that. Okay, do I start by explaining in the mandible? Two implant overdenture versus a conventional denture, yes. Do I explain fixed on four implants? Yes. In the maxilla, will I explain an overdenture versus fixed? 100%. Will I talk about a prosthetic reconstruction? Yes. And we talk about budgets. And from there, we choose the case that's appropriate. Not every case is an over board. Not every case is an overdenture. Do I have a lot of tricks in my armamentarium? Yes. So we have to choose and tailor the case to that patient. So knowing the patient's desires and expectations, the dentist can determine and educate as to what can be done for that patient. Critical statement, okay? The big question becomes, as I said, every patient coming into your office is how much pain, time, and money, okay? First slide is fake, second slide is a real pan from a dentist. That's 19 implants for a locator case, okay? Do I think that's excessive? Probably, right? But what that brings me to, Okay. is patients talk. Okay. Patients do a lot of research before they come into your office. Okay. Nowadays, some of the questions that patients come in with and treatment plans and second and third opinions, they've done research. They understand materials we're using. There's forums for patients, dentistry forums, discussion advice, and chat for dentists and patients. There's Dental Fear Central, all on four forum. Okay. One of my most useful things I found during my lurking time were the journal and diaries that people have written and the progress they've made over weeks and months, as well as setbacks. Okay. Put $100 at the entertainment center, let's go to work. We're supposed to go out to eat on our anniversary. When I came home, the $100 was gone. He was gone for two days after that. And when he came home, I asked him what happened to the money because he didn't know what happened to it. <laughs> Now, with that said, we have to remember, okay, patients' fears. And with this series focusing on a low overdenture, is the patient insecure about losing their temporary? Are they insecure about losing their final? Do they want increased biting force, right? That is part of the whole reason why I use the more mini implants is to decrease the phobia of a patient losing their temporary, having increased security, right? So when you look at phobias and you have to talk to the patient, why have you avoided the dentist for the last 10 years? I elected that both arches done as I knew if I had not, if I had them done separately, I would not come back. It's a very true statement. And sometimes we have to make that call that we are doing both arches together in order to expedite the treatment to make the patient comfortable. Impressions are my real fear, gagging, from dentures is a fear, right? Emotional preparation of the patient is just as important as completion of the provisional and final restoration. I just recently completed a case last week and I just saw this patient. I spent multiple visits talking to this patient about removing. This patient unfortunately had about 14 to 16 implants that were all failing. So we had to remove her upper restoration, her lower restoration. The surgery was more complex than we anticipated, but we had prepared her that Hey, the surgery is going to go X, Y, and Z. You may leave with an upper denture. You may leave with an upper and lower denture. You may leave with implants and a fixed lower bridge. 
It depends on what is going to happen that day. The patient I just saw recently after about 10 days of healing, and she is fine. She understands where we are. She understands things are done well. But the reason you do this and you take this time is so that there is no surprises and the patient understands what we are going to do. I like this statement, and this drives home a lot. And this has really shifted how I do my overdentures and I plan. I know I will need the upper and the lower dentures, but I am not ready for both at once. As I said, we had a 59-year-old female patient with history of diabetes, okay, high blood pressure currently controlled, okay, 10 plus years wearing a maxillary denture, mandibular RPD, phased treatment plan. Okay? So we removed her upper teeth, rebased her current partial, put her in a temporary denture, let her heal down. Now, when can you do this? Okay. When we have a realistic occlusal plane, if there was a roller coaster here and I could not transition her in an even controlled way, this isn't an option. You have to do both arches. You have to explain to the patient, as long as they understand this is going to take longer, it's going to be a little more expensive, but we will achieve what they want, that is fine. Okay, so now we start assessing this patient for a lower. Okay, we have an upper temporary denture that we have to make sure that the teeth are in the proper position. The patient's pleased with the aesthetics. We have function okay, with the lower partial. Now, this becomes a driving factor for me. If a patient comes in with an existing denture and they have a worn denture that they've been happy with, I will make them a new complete denture and not really discuss implants. I will give them the options, but I will probably just make them a new denture. Now, a patient like this that comes in with a history of a maxillary complete denture, a mandibular RPD, okay, or a failing mandibular dentition, this is where I highly recommend placing two mandibular implants and transitioning them to a over denture. If they're comfortable with the partial, fantastic. If their partial is uncomfortable, I want to know why is their partial uncomfortable. If the partial was made well, okay, the extensions are good, and they start telling me they didn't like the fishtail motion. They didn't like the movement. You're going to have problems with the overdenture. If they tell me the partial was uncomfortable and it's rubbing on a tori, well, then that makes sense and we can fix that. So you have to start diagnosing what that patient likes, doesn't like, and how we can replicate and achieve the function that they want. Take a CT scan, adequate bone, we'll remove the teeth, we'll find two implant placement, and this we're going to go on lateral incisors to prevent that seesawing motion. Okay. Patient's reaction to tooth loss can be similar to loss of other bodily organs and can cause lowered self-esteem and psychological isolation, where the patients avoid company. They avoid family members. This is critical. And remember, denture wear adaptation problems, 30 to 50% claim they do not have complete chewing ability. Fully agree with that. 25% can only chew soft or mashed foods, and 11% of patients do not use their dentures at all. Okay. Remember this chart. It's really an important chart for when I'm talking to patients. When you have your teeth, 100% capacity. No teeth, no denture, zero. Lower denture, 10% functional capacity. Implant foreign overdenture. Two implants in the mandible, 60%. Game changer. Increases in stability. Patients are happy, right? Now, an implant bridge is only 90% of their functional capacity. There is differences in our restorations. An implant overdenture has extensions, flanges. Okay, it is removable. You have to take it out. It is only vertically secured. Okay, so this was an interesting study. Okay, when we look at this, okay, this within subject comparison tested the null hypothesis that there is no difference in patient satisfaction and oral health related quality of life when an individual with an edentulous mandible is rehabilitated with two implant overdenture or a three implant supported fixed prosthesis. You're going to get this question, Doc. What should I do? Should I do a fixed reconstruction? Should I do the overdenture? Is it worth the investment? Is it worth the money? Should I buy the boat and just get a conventional denture? This is all things that patients are thinking about and we have to assess and talk to them, okay? Both treatment modalities provided a significant and similar improvement in patient satisfaction. However, a statistically higher score was reported for stability, retention, and ease of chewing with a fixed dental prosthesis. I fully believe in that. You're not going to change an SUV into a sports car in most cases. And we have to explain this to a patient without allowing them to test drive it. We have to talk about the differences in size and have demonstration models. We have to talk about 
the retention and the stability of an overdenture versa bridge. And this is critical for them to understand. Okay, so where do I place implants? The number one reason is the reason in red. Patients who wish to improve their ability to masticate food. The patient comes in and says, Doc, I want to be able to bite into something. I want to be able to chew something more than mashed potatoes. I will be putting implants in on those cases. Okay. What implant systems do we select and how do we start selecting those implants? Okay. What pushes me to choose using the mini implants? Like I just stated, a patient that has a terminal mandibular dentition, I will typically put the mini implants in. If the patient has had a denture and we're increasing the, we're going to try to increase retention with a overdenture system, then I typically leave the minis out. Okay, and then we transition them. This is a important testimonial okay, that kind of drives home a lot of points that I was just highlighting there. Going for the removable prosthesis on implants was the best decision. We were both a bit worried about the surgery at our age, but the benefits of going through this process are more rewarding. I can eat everything I want to. I feel totally secure when talking to other people. And my husband's and my quality of life has increased tremendously. Life's fun again. I do not mind removing my denture for cleaning as it allows me to clean very easily and gives me a fresh feeling. There's a few important statements there. I do not mind removing my teeth. Critical. First thing I ask a patient, do you mind removing your teeth or are they going to need to be fixed and you don't take them out? Only person that can take them out is me. They say, I don't mind removing. Fantastic. What else did you notice? Mine and my husband's quality of life has increased tremendously. Happy wife, happy life, right? Very, very important. Okay? You got to make sure you have the significant under involved in the treatment planning process. Okay? So in our office, what do I use? I use Nobel BioCare as my primary implant, and I use Sterngold, okay, true implants, as a value increasing system in my practice. Okay? We focus on complex implant reconstructions. Okay? Do I use the trefoil? Sure. Do I do all in four? Absolutely. Do I do fixed crown and bridge, PFM, zirconia, titanium base reconstructions? 100%. Okay? That goes without question. But now we have to start looking at what else can I do? Okay? And if you think about it, not everybody can afford a Mercedes. Not everybody can afford a luxury item. And we have to think about how do we add value but still create a service for these patients. Okay? And that is how the True System got incorporated into my office because it has a Nobel compatible connection. So I have to start looking at what I need to stock, what I don't need to stock. What is the cost of the system versus the cost of the other system? And it gives us value. Does it create reproducible results? Does it create restoration stability? <coughs> so that is how I start doing it. A lot of patients, I will talk to them about our fees. And if they say, hey, I can't afford this fee, as long as that restoration fits those molds, I may shift the plan. And we may take the frame of that. We may add um, using the Stern Gold implant with the Stern Snap based on the value. Okay. So when I'm talking to patients, I have to make sure that I am not compromising the result. I'm going to have good long-term stability. I'm going to have a reproducible result. And I have to choose what is going to be better for that patient. Okay? Can I use and switch components where I place a Nobel implant and then the stern snaps? Absolutely. So I want a system that is going to be able to be interchanged with minimal overlap of parts but give me adaptability to achieve a restoration that's going to be stable and functional for that patient. So at the end of the day, it's the clinician's responsibility to select the most appropriate method of retention for each individual case. And where I've been using okay, the sterling old implants quite often is in the maxilla with the new CM lock attachments, palace over and enter and four implant. It allows me to work in limited space. I don't have the complexity of a bar. I don't have the increased lab bill of it. I have chair side pickup that are efficient. And I have a framework that allows the patient's palate to be open, especially when I'm working around defects or gaggers. Um, and I can achieve a stable prosthesis. So in my opinion, this is one of the futures of how I end up treatment planning. So we want to improve the quality of the dentures, patients' lives, and increase the practice's revenue, right? So. 
I want to close as many cases as I can. I want to make sure I can create as many um, functionally acceptable cases as we can. And you have to choose and tailor your system in your office. Okay. We have to make dentistry fun. Okay. So you have to have a technique that you enjoy doing. Okay. You don't want to dread doing that technique. If you don't like it, find something else to do. Okay. So this drives me into the marketing concept. And almost half of adults are missing teeth. Okay. Increasing awareness of dental implants has resulted in a greater segment of the patient population actively seeking out implant-based dental treatment. Capturing this awareness has resulted in a substantial growth in dental implant education, including surgical and restorative techniques to perform dental implant therapy. One of the biggest challenges is recruiting patients interested in implementing implant treatment and then be able to offer multiple types of treatment with a range of fees that makes treatment affordable. Really critical. This is an interesting article that was growing a practice, right? So that's kind of how the concept of keeping two implants with the same component and being able to interchange and change awareness and change the fees, okay? And, but have the same predictable outcome is critical, right? It's our name. Now, marketing your practice is a challenge, okay? Every environment is different, okay? I'm up in Green Bay, completely different animal from where I practiced in Chicago. But to be successful, a high-end implant practice, you need to make patients aware of your crown, bridge, and implant services. People laugh, okay? But there was that ear, your ears are burning CD where somebody went around and surveyed and called dental offices and asked, hey, does Dr. House place implants? And their front desk said no, or they're expensive. Okay, so marketing strategies are broken up in two tasks, right? There's external, getting new patients in the door, and then internal, what is in your practice? Every practice has denture patients in its existing pool. Happy denture patients will refer other denture patients. Critical statement, the best referrals in my practice are existing patients. They know what my fees are. They know what we can do. They know what our staff is. They know our office, and they believe in you, okay? Hi, I'm Dr. Joseph Lesnowski. Hello, my name's Matthew Hellis. I'm a prosthodontist. I'm a prosthodontist here at Bay Lake Center for Complex Dentistry in the Upper Midwest. Our practice helps people that have more debilitated dental issues that need more complex care. We take all the challenges that exist, whether it's a single tooth all the way to a complex rehabilitation, and our main goal and our primary focus is to treat the patient in a comfortable manner that allows them to restore their smile that they are proud of. The dental technology that we have in the office is focusing on doing a great job for the patients and keeping them safe. So the surgeries are quicker, more precise, and a lot easier on the patients. We have a variety of options to replace teeth. We can use bridges, implants, partials, complete dentures. Following completion of the treatment, Many patients have told us that we have a compassionate, caring staff that has made the dental treatment process fun, and they have truly left as our friends. The patients come in here holding their hands in front of their face, and they leave beaming. I've seen a few patients actually kick their heels as they walk out the door. At the end of the day, I'm most proud of our team's ability to treat and manage any type of dental problem that presents to our office. So why do I show that, okay? You have to make yourself aware. Okay? And I can't stress this enough. As I early, said earlier, my wife is our office manager and handles okay, our marketing in general. It took us three years to find a marketing team that tailored to what we needed as a prof's office. That's a challenge. I don't wanna be chasing small cases. I want a tailored approach to what we wanna do in our office. And we ended up going through several marketing companies. One of the big things is I do not handle all of this on this slide, okay? My wife handles this. I kind of give direction. My partner gives direction on what we want and she executes our plan. You need a staff that is dedicated to this, okay? And one of the biggest things, okay, that has been successful for us is creating new patient reviews, okay, or existing patient reviews, okay? Having an experience in your office, right? It's a powerful statement and having multiple, multiple reviews that are five stars on your website, linked through Google, is critical to generating patients. One of the big mistakes I see, okay, is not preparing for patient contact. As I said, we have to make patients aware that we are going to do this technique. You have to 
go get the education. Then we have to have our staff educated that we can do it and we can execute this case. And then you have to have your front desk ready to understand that we can effectively schedule and execute these cases. And you have to streamline the treatment, right? The first area of contact is your front desk, right? So they're gonna, a patient's gonna call. I don't care how effective your marketing is. If the front desk does not close and effectively schedule that patient, you're missing patients, right? Your team training is not only in the, the operatory, but it's your front desk and your support staff as well, right? The majority of patients want to feel a real connection to the doctor and the office staff before they make a decision to proceed. That's critical, right? And when we think about case acceptance, right? Your professional responsibility is to create a level playing field between the doctor, the staff, and the patient during the consultation appointment. They have to understand the treatment options. They have to understand that you are confident that you can execute this case and you can thoroughly explain it in a simplified manner. A simplified manner is the key. Don't overwhelm the patient. Explain what the techniques are, the value, and then we execute, right? We have to get these cases accepted. We have to identify whether they are in our office or we're going to externally market. We have to choose the CE course that we're going to do. And then we have to make sure we're educated in order to do it. And with that said, I'm going to thank DSG, thank Sterngold for um, sponsoring all of this. I'm going to stress the point that if you want to start incorporating these techniques in your office, we have to educate webinars live person training, live surgery, live restorative courses, bring our team, market both internal, external, train our staff, both clinical, as well as support staff or front desk. Make sure you have somebody dedicated to handle this and you have the equipment on hand ahead of the case and then integrate the cases in your office. With that, I would see very high success. And with that, we'll take about five to 10 minutes of questions if there are. And if not, we will wrap up and say thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Hallis, somebody just commented. They want to know if you sh can show the previous slide on options that you just had up. I think so there's some options on there. Was that the one? Oh yeah, simplified options, yeah. Somebody yep, had this asked is, about so that. In our office, when I present, I present in a consult room, okay? I don't present typically in the operatory. You know, the operatory is a war zone when you really think about it. These are just simple flow charts that we have made up. I just went to integrated iPads um, that have PowerPoints brought up for patients based on what we're doing. Um, there's overdenture one, there's diagnostic models so they can feel and touch, but if they can't see it, they're not going to be able to understand it because if I just start rattling off, hey, we're going to place these two locator abutments, I'm going to make sure I have 15 millimeters of interocclusal space. You know, DSG is going to make you this wonderful metal reinforced denture that's going to snap in. We're going to do a chair side pickup and it's going to be great. You might as well say, thank you. It was nice meeting you. Yeah. And that Dr. Hallis, I remember, you know, in the beginning of your presentation, you talked about communication and uh, case planning. I remember when I first started out in this industry many years ago, we didn't have the collaboration we do now, do now in the laboratory uh, and, and planning cases. Uh, it was just something that wasn't there in our industry, you know, and, uh, uh, and uh, with implants and these types of cases, it's essential. We need that, uh, that collaboration and uh, communication between everybody, the dentist, the uh, oral surgeon, ourselves, sometimes a periodontist, and, uh, and even the, um, you know, the uh, implant rep, you know, so it's essential for those, uh, these successful cases to come to fruition, that information. We agree on that. Yeah. Yeah, so. I mean, there's probably not a day that doesn't go by that I don't talk to our lab techs in some manner. Nowadays, with cell phones, you can quickly get pictures sent. Hey, what do you think of this? We can talk about materials we're going to choose. Right. I think that's absolutely critical. Yeah, definitely. Definitely is. So, uh, but we're going to open up the questions. If anybody has any questions uh, tonight's uh, webinar, we'll open it up and, uh, and we'll be able to answer some. I think we have about 10 minutes left, uh, so we'll do that too. So, uh, but um, I had to tell Dennis, a story. Dennis, we did yeah. have an earlier one. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, somebody asked, Dr. Hollis, if you could show the resource page or maybe send it to us and we can email it out of those uh, three books that you referenced. Oh, yeah. I love how you're so fast with your PowerPoints. <laughs>
There we go. Thank you. No problem. That was an easy one. That was good. Okay, great. <laughs> good. I was going to mention, uh, you know, you, you talked about earlier, Dr. Hallis, about <clears throat> having the uh, everything you need, uh, you know, before the surgery and the essential things you need with tools and, and components uh, in the office beforehand. And I, it just brought to mind one time I was doing a, a all on six conversion in the office and, uh, and I called the, um, uh, the implant rep and I said, you know, I said, are you going to bring extra screws, final screws and everything like that? I, I said, I have temporary cylinders and screws, but, uh, and he, he said, he, and he called up, he couldn't make it, couldn't make it to the office. And this patient had an immediate denture made that morning with six implants placed. And we got to the dental office here. I, was doing, I brought all my equipment with me <clears throat> doing a chair side conversion. I was in a full upper denture. And uh, the assistant took out the temporary cylinders with the screws and accidentally threw, accidentally threw all the screws out. Oh, and so I didn't good. have any extra with me. So, and everything was thrown out and we, everybody started panicking. And he said, well, did you have the lap screws? I said, you really want to put the lap screws in as, as final? And what happened he, at the, it was like two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, they got a hold of the uh, oral surgeon who was right down the street uh, in Manhattan. And he had some extra screws, thankfully. And we were able to complete the uh, chair side conversion. But yeah. it's so essential to get that. You have the, 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 all that with you beforehand. You know. And, uh, I always ask when the rep is calling the borrow equipment, who is it for? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Flies on the water are expensive. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but uh, I don't know if we have any other questions here. I think uh, no, we not nothing yet there. But um, I know I have things pop into my head too. Um, you had also mentioned, um, you know, metal reinforcement in these dentures, and I think I brought it up another time. But uh, uh, that's that's also uh, necessary. But have you ever used any of the new super polymer materials like peak or pectin to reinforce the inter internally these dentures? Yes, I'm just yeah. not sure about them, right? Right, right. In terms of it, it they're cool. They're, they, they have good flexural strength. They got good material properties. Um, right. I'm not sure how we would recover it if I wanted to rebase the denture, like mm -hmm. the peak ones, because I, I think we would have to grind it, and I think it would be right. okay, and then we could rebase to it, right? You know, you can shoot. It's just I'm not sure. One of the right. things with the metal is the patient can see it. Right. And metal, you can kind of relate to. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when patients can kind of relate to a product and it's strong and they see it and they understand, hey, this is why that denture was more yeah. good. The one thing I, I haven't been successful on really est establishing it on the peak ones when we do the reinforced framework is the same tissue stops that we do on the metal frameworks. They seem to just be better. Right. metal than the peak and i don't know if that's from the finishing uh, mm -hmm. that we're doing with the lab but when we go to you know reline and check the contacts it always seems that the metal tissue stops incorporated in that denture when i'm checking in hygiene right. the heat of the reline just seem to be easier to evaluate that's a good point you know and you know why i i, I saw that happen also and because when, even when i designed partials uh, with these uh, uh super polymer frameworks like uh yeah you know, with uh, salve and those types of partials um these, there's, a, um, there's a tool in the software, you know, with placing tissue stops. And sometimes what happens, I see you know, when I coach technicians, they'll block out those areas, they'll put a little block, you know, they'll block it out, just like they're blocking out an undercut. Mm -hmm. And you don't have that rest on a tissue stop. So that's, I've, I've seen that also, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, but, uh, it's all the, you know, it's the same technique, it's just adapting to all this new technology. Same with the right. cam software that we're using. And it's like, all right, I know that widget's there that I need. Where mm -hmm. is it? True, that's true. Yeah. And it's the same with the denture teeth selections, you know, like we were using Yamahachi and now we use a lot of Fonairs. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the milling teeth, I think are way stronger, but they're not as aesthetic. You know? Right, right. You know, the Fonairs, unfortunately, I'm still seeing chipping with them, whereas you don't see it with the milled teeth. Mm -hmm. you know, the layered tooth, it's pretty. Um, so it, it just kind of varies on the products that we choose. Yeah, and as far as denture teeth go, you know, I, I noticed too over the years, I, they tend to wear faster with uh, with these implant dentures and implant over dentures. And uh, to utilize a tooth, like you said, either you know, Fenaris, Fenaris Two is a, a great tooth. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's also other options there. There's teeth with ceramic fillers in there that wear, you know, have almost they wear almost like natural dentition. But mm -hmm. you don't want a tooth that's going to chip and you know have uh, you know a couple of layers on there, like a two or three layer tooth, because sometimes. 
when you start grinding or it chips, you get to a layer that's soft and it's not going to wear as well, you know? Uh, so uh, I noticed that over the years, but yeah, it's good, good quality tooth on these, on these cases. Don't skimp because I've had, I've had clinicians call me up and said, you know, well, do I really have to get a premium tooth with these, this, this type of denture? I said, I think you should. Patient's spending a lot of money. You're spending a lot of time. There's a lot of case planning. Let's use the best materials and uh, included in those best materials are denture teeth. Yeah, yeah so I, I agree. Yeah, the, denture, the denture teeth are really important, especially with the wear coefficients built in. Right, the right. composite teeth, are, I think, are quite strong, especially mm -hmm. the materials that are monolithic. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Good point there. So, uh, but I don't see any other questions here. Um, I don't know if uh, Fantastic. Uh, anybody has any other questions here or uh, any final comments from Patrick or anybody? Or, uh, we could... No, we're good? No? Good. Okay, great. Well, Dr. Hallis, this has been a great series. I really enjoyed it. And I could talk about this stuff forever, but, uh, and, uh, you know, as a, as a dental technician all these years, I think the, the highlight of my career was starting to do these types of cases and, and lecture on them and train and even go to co-training with the, with the clinicians on these types of, uh, these cases on different various courses. And I think one of the things you mentioned before is, uh, you know, uh, go to uh, hands-on courses and learn all you can on these, and it's only going to enhance your career and make these uh, cases better. And you'll have the ultimate goal of patient satisfaction. So, uh, exactly. So with that, I want to thank everybody and have a good night. Thanks, Dr. Hallis. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a great night, and we hope to see you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr.